Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the show, Fernando. Welcome to the show, guys. Today, we have a truck, and I'm guessing you figured that out, because look how tall Fernando is. That is right. No, I don't grow up in one night. Step stool. Today, we're gonna work on spark plugs. No, we're not. <laughs> What's a spark plug? Just kidding. Today, we have a Toyota Tundra. Yes, it is. It's the ongoing question of my life, Tundra or Tacoma. This is a Tundra. Today we're gonna to be putting in a sub amp. Let's roll the beginning and we'll show you what's in it from the factory. So from the factory, you have two options in this vehicle. Premium JBL system or base model with this has. Has a touch screen in the dash, mediocre at best. It has a center channel. It has two speakers here in the corners. The center channel runs off of right and left. It's a dual voice coil. The wires run out to here, loop out of here, come into here, and then do the same on the driver's side. So it's not an upmixed, it's not an EQ'd, it's not a process center channel. It's just a summing of left and right into one speaker. There's a six by nine in the front door and a six and a half in the rear. And that is the size of the speaker itself, not of the brackets. If you're gonna put speakers in here, you will need plastic brackets to mount your speakers in. They're not just gonna pop right into the holes. So make sure if you're gonna upgrade those, you head over to metraonline.com and pick up the brackets to install them properly. But Toyota does something really unique in this vehicle. There's still an amplifier in here. The amplifier only powers the door speakers. It doesn't power the dash. The dash is powered off of the radio using the deck power, whatever that might be. The deck power then, full power, goes into the amplifier. So their factory amplifier actually uses high level input. Out of that amplifier goes to the door speakers. Seems kind of weird, I know. But we're gonna take a look at that today and show you how that all works as well as we're also going to be putting in a key 501 because naturally there's like base roll off and equalization and all that garbage happening in this car and we want to fix that because all we're adding is 112 and we want to make it sound the best that we can. If we were doing something bigger and integrating into this, there's always the option of just adding the key lock, which will de-EQ it and get us a nice flat signal, but we won't need to do that. The key 501 is perfect for that scenario. Let's grab some tools. Let's head over to the passenger seat. We'll take that out and we'll start talking about how we're gonna integrate into this. To remove this seat, there's four 14 millimeter bolts. In the back, it has these plastic covers that cover it. To get them off, both hands. In the very middle is a clip. You can kind of reach around from the back side and push it in with your fingers. It's made to come out. It's this little nightmare right here. You can kind of push it from, and then, yeah. Remove the four 14 millimeter bolts. Once you get the seat bolts out, remove the running board here on the side, grab it in the two corners, it'll pop right out. There are three clips in the center that'll just unsnap. We don't need to remove the factory amplifier. There is a cover over it if you need to get more access to it. We just need to get to these plugs. There's three pins on it. If you pull up, they'll just come out. Be careful, you don't want to bend the metal. This is the little amplifier that powers the system. We have two plugs here, remove these, and we can start our testing. Some of the tools we're gonna need for this, a handheld RTA, a polarity checker, and a digital multimeter. A pen and a pad of paper to write down what we find out. The first tool up is going to be our digital multimeter. We wanna find out if any of these wires have power, which we know they do because it's an amplifier. We wanna do that so we can just eliminate them off of the board. Set your digital multimeter to DC, which is the line with the dashes beneath it. Look for the two fattest wires in the harness. Typically those are your power and ground. In this case, that'd be a green and a red. Take one test lead, go to ground, and then probe the wires. The red one, conveniently enough, has 12 volts. The fat green wire is just doing some strange stuff. It has no continuity to ground. Looking closely, there is a white with a black stripe, and that one is our ground. Red, 12 volt, white, black, ground. We can eliminate those two off of what we need to figure out. There's a light blue wire here that is smaller than all the wires on here. That may be some form of a turn on. And then on this same plug is paired wires, which is a green, blue, and a purple, pink that are twisted together. Those may be speakers. Switching over to ohm, you can test those two. We're getting a 2.2 and another 2.2. My guess is these are speakers because 
because they're twisted together and we're getting a 2.2 ohm load, which is pretty normal for a Toyota. They like to use two ohm speakers. Turn on our PT9A Plus polarity checker. We're getting a popping sound out of this door. This has a microphone in the end of it and it can read the pulses coming out of the speaker and it'll light up green or red. In this case, we're getting a red, which means we have these pins in backwards. If I flip them, take another reading. This time I get green. That means my light green is positive passenger and my blue is negative passenger. Testing the pink and purple, that's the driver's side. I'm gonna go test that speaker over there. Having two PT9A pluses is very convenient. Purple is positive driver. Pink is negative driver. We found our driver's front door speakers. For the most part, we have all the information we need off of that. Now we have this bigger plug. This should have the feed from the radio as well as the rear speakers. Coming down into it here, they're all twisted pairs. Follow the twisted pairs up into the harness. What should happen is Four of these wires, two pairs, should act like speakers, and then the other eight shouldn't. Those eight are gonna be the signals coming from the radio. That's a speaker. That's another speaker. Not a speaker. Definitely not a speaker. Not a speaker. On this side of the plug, definitely two speakers. On this side of the plug, going to the radio. To test for that, polarity pop. The first set, green and white, are driver's rear. The second set, purple, red, or passenger rear. You could use our polarity tester and go find out which one is positive and negative, just like we did on the front. These other eight wires are in fact coming from the radio. This is really what I wanna take a look at. For this testing, we're gonna use the Educar Test and Tune app. We're gonna play some pink noise, which is the static sound you're hearing right now. That is the dash and center speakers that are being powered off of the radio. There's no speakers in the rear, that are being powered off the radio. We wanted to find out which one of these pairs of wires are driver's front, passenger front, driver's rear, passenger rear. If we went to the fader on the radio and faded it to that corner of the car, that would be the only one of these that is putting out any noise. If you have a digital multimeter, take the digital multimeter, set it to AC now, which is the squiggly line, and then probe leads until you see something like this. Make sure when you fade it though, you fade it all the way. Don't one step it, because even at one step, it is going to bleed over into the others. Turn the radio up. Turn the radio down, then turn it back up slowly. And you'll see the number increase. And that'll tell you what channel you've tapped into. Write it down, take those notes. For this, I'd like to find the front two channels. I'm going to fade it to the passenger speaker here. Probably my first set of wires. I get a little bit of signal. Second set of wires, I get a lot of signal. Third set, a little bit of signal. Fourth set, a little bit of signal. Going back to that second set, these are definitely my passenger front door wires. The gray pink are my passenger door speakers. Now I need to find out which one of these is positive and which one of these is negative. Going back to the PT9A Plus, there is an option on this for input and output. To test the way we were testing originally is output. If we select input, go back into those same two wires, and we play a polarity test track now, we can meter the signal coming from the radio over the wire. This polarity track goes green, green, red, or positive, positive, negative. You have a 50-50 chance of getting it right. In this case, gray is negative, pink is positive. We can repeat this process on all of the speaker wires to get a full map of what this harness is doing. And we can use that information to tap into any of the high level to low levels we want. What I'd like to do now is take a look at the actual signal coming from the radio. I wanna get an idea of what it looks like. Is it full range? Is it not full range? I assume it has to be some form of full range because it's feeding the amplifier that's powering the mid base in the door. 
My guess is the ones in the dash have some form of base blocker on them. Switching to the RTA, go back to the pink noise, and this will show us the signal that's coming out of the radio. This side here is going to be the subwoofer sound, and this side here will be your treble. So this is 20 hertz, this is 20,000. It's not a terrible looking signal. Plug the amplifier back in, and now I wanna see what's coming out of these doors. This is the signal coming out of the door. It clearly has a high pass filter on it. This is the signal feeding the rear door. Definitely some weird EQ action going on there. Now we have a better look of what this is doing. Full range out of the radio, into the amplifier. There is some EQ on it for sure, but there's definitely more EQ crossover going on in this amplifier. The last thing I wanna check is how much voltage is coming out of the radio into the amplifier, and how much is coming out of the amplifier into these speakers. The reason for testing that is so that we get the right high level to low level adapter. If you were to use an amplifier and or high level that didn't support the amount of voltage that was coming out of the amplifier or the radio, you could melt it in or blow up the input of the amplifier. To do that test, back to the digital multimeter with AC voltage. You're also gonna want a tone generator. You don't wanna just play one specific frequency. You wanna play multiple frequencies because as you saw, there is an EQ coming off of that factory radio. If there is some form of a subsonic filter or bass roll off or anything like that, that is let's say at the telltale 40 Hertz, you're gonna get a wrong reading. You could get a volt down, two volts down. That would be bad. Play multiple frequencies, play 40, 50, 60, 70. If you're testing for the high output, don't just play 1,000 hertz. Play 4,000 hertz, 8,000 hertz. Play 500 hertz. Play a bunch of frequencies, write them down, and that will give you the average of how much voltage is coming out of this radio. Tune the volume up to two thirds or just a tad bit more. Don't go full max. Start with 40 hertz and press play. Now you may not even hear the sound, especially in this case because the three and a halfs in the dash have a high pass crossover on them. So make sure you pay attention to the meter. Eight volts, jump up to 70. Eight volts, seven and a half. You can continuously move on, play 10,000. 10,000 was three volts. If we were to do this across all of the frequencies, it would actually show us that EQ curve that we saw on the RTA because you're plotting the voltage on a line, which is all the RTA is doing, just it's doing it all at once. If you have a 30 band RTA, it is having 30 voltmeters that are giving you a digital display. One of the reasons why these things cost so much. That's not stopping you from doing an analog version of it, and you could plot this and see what your EQ curve if you test every octave along the way. We don't need to do that for this because we're only concentrating on the subwoofer side of it, and it looks like eight volts is the amount of power coming out of the radio. Nice, that is plenty of signal. Definitely what we're gonna be using. You do have to make sure that your high level to low level on your amplifier has at least 10 volts of input capability. You don't wanna obviously run the minimum amount necessary. 10 volts is where I would start. Most amplifiers have at least 10 volts of input, but make sure you consult your owner's manual. Even though that's ideally the signal we're gonna be using, I still wanna know what this amplifier is putting out to these mid bass in the door. Because this has an EQ, playing multiple frequencies is still a good idea. I'm gonna start with 50 Hertz. And that's given us an 8.3 volt output, which is right in line with what the deck is putting out. The amplifier that's in it probably is the same size as the one that's in the radio. They just wanted to break it apart and make this a louder sounding stereo, which is ironic considering this is one of the worst sounding stereos in a vehicle. It's funny when you power something appropriately that doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna sound better. It's odd. Now that we know all the information we can about what's happening between the radio, the amplifier, the sound output, all the polarities, it's time Time to get this amplifier in the car. That leads us to the next step, which is building a mount for the amplifier. We're gonna be using quarter inch ABS for that. But before we do that, let's head over to the bench and take a look at the amplifier, the Key 501. Welcome to the show. This is the Key 501. There's a couple unique features about this amplifier and we wanna talk about them. First things first, this is stop start compliant. For those of you that don't know what stop start is, you're lucky. But the rest of us that do, man, it sucks. If you've ever been sitting at a stoplight, and you look to the left, or you look to the right, or you're in the car, and the engine shuts off. 
And you're like, wait a minute, what happened? Why did it do that? We won't even get started on that. The fact that it's shut off means it has to start back up. It can only stay off for a certain amount of time, according to the DOT. After that, it's going to start back up. When it starts back up, there's a severe voltage drop in the car. It can go as low as eight and a half volts. Most amplifiers today don't work under 10 volts. That means they're going to shut off and turn back on once the alternator kicks in. When an amplifier says stop start compliant, that means it can take that low voltage hit and perform throughout it. It won't turn off. All the kicker key products are capable of doing that. Inside the box, we get the immediate stop. Kicker tech support can help. Definitely give them a call. If you're having some form of an issue, that's what they're there for. That's why they put this piece of paper in the box. Quick start guide. On the back side of it here at the top is the English version of what you need to do in order to program this amplifier after the fact. There is also online, located here if you scan this QR code, the full instruction manual of everything this amplifier is capable of doing. There's a bag of parts, not many. The input harness, it has RCAs, but the reason why it is so long is because it is a high level, low level, all built into one. If you have an aftermarket head unit, you can plug in your RCAs here. If you have a factory radio like we do, you cut these off, connect them to the output of the radio. An Allen key for the Allen key screws, two zip ties and four screws. If you lose that piece of paper on the top of the box here is also that same QR code you can scan. For something this small, there's a lot of stuff going on. And this top corner is the base knob input. For this amp, if you would like one, you need the CX ARC remote base knob controller. It's an eighth inch headphone jack style base knob. The cable is like 18, 20 feet long. It's super long. The base knob itself is designed to mount up with two screws here or you can pull the knob off and disassemble it and flush mount it somewhere. There's also two screws in the bag for mounting it using the bracket. Gain controls between 0 and 11 volts. Next to that is your high level low level switch. When pressed in is high level which we will be doing. DC offset on and off. Oh we got a test for that. That is what we use to turn the amplifier on instead of remote turn on. Most of the time it's six volts however it can be lower or higher. Positive test lead into the speaker output from the radio. Negative go to ground and we have a three volt. Turn the car off. If you'll notice it stays on for a couple minutes that's perfectly normal and then it'll slowly go away. It's waiting for the car to boot down. In some cars, it'll turn on as soon as you unlock the door. This also had that light blue wire over here. I wanna test that as well. Turn the car back on. And that's 12 volts. Turn the car off. And it goes away. So we have two options on this one. We can use this light blue wire here as a remote turn on, which is 12 volts, probably a really good idea, or we could use the DC offset. Though it's three volts, not all amplifiers will take a three volt DC offset trigger. Fortunately for us, the kicker key will, but I like the idea of having a dedicated on and off 12 volt circuit. I feel this one is probably gonna be more reliable for us. So in this case, we're kind of lucky. We're gonna be using the 12 volt trigger at the amplifier, so we don't need to turn this on. In is on, out is off. The three knobs across the top here are your high pass filter, also known as a subsonic between 10 and 40 hertz, your low pass filter between 40 and 160 hertz, and of course the all important bass boost, zero to 60 Bs of boost to give you that mm sound. The key button is located over here. This is what we're gonna use to do the programming in the end. Some specifications on the amplifier. At four ohms, it's 150. At two ohms, it's 300. At one ohm, it is 500. Frequency response is between 10 and 160 hertz. Signals to noise ratio is greater than 90 dB. Input sensitivity is 125 millivolts to five volts for the low level and one volt to 40 volts for the high level. Variable 24 dB per octave electronic crossover. Let's get this mounted to our amp board. I wanna make sure whatever mount I make takes in consideration the size of this amp cover. This is the amplifier thinking this area over here is going to be a perfect place. I can make an L that comes off of the seat bolt down and around. The power wire needs to go towards the center console. 
there's enough room at this end for that. Our ground is located right here in the factory ground point. So that's a short distance away. I don't need a ton of room on this. I just need enough room to get to all my gain controls and the key button, which I have access to. I can move this out just a little bit to get more room for that. So basic L shape would be perfect. What I've come up with is a piece that's 12 inches long, 10 inches high, and I'll remove this chunk right here. The seat bolt will be located this way and our amplifier will sit on it like this. Let's head over to the saw. And this is what I needed. I thinned this area out here just a little bit because there's not one on either side. I don't want the seat to sit kind of strange. Quarter inch probably wouldn't, but let's just play it safe. I'll slide this up underneath the seat. That'll allow me to figure out where I need to drill my hole. And we can get it over the bench and start getting the amplifier all wired out. The way this is gonna sit on this bracket, power wire, speaker wire are all gonna come out this way, and the signal wire is gonna come out this way. The remote turn on will also wrap around and go into this. That factory amplifier actually covers about this much of it. That means I have to strategically place this amplifier on here. When working with ABS, always pre-drill the hole. It does not like you to just put a screw into it. The first wire I'm going to add into this is my base knob that is going to run this way. My remote turn on wire, which is going to run this way. Fernando's already taken the time to put heat shrink, the ends, and braided loom over the wiring. To line our holes up on this run of wire here, we'll grab our wire ruler and a 964 drill bit. Set this in place where we want it to stop and start. And sometimes when you get to the edge here, you can just drill in your own holes matching these as the guide. There's two ends to a zip tie, obviously. You have the head and you have the feed. Depending on how you're gonna mount your amplifier, the head either has to go on the top or the bottom. Obviously, the bottom is the prettier place for it, but whatever you decide, make sure that you always put the feed leg through the same hole. In this case, we'll be going with the hole closest to the amplifier, feeding it through, coming around to the outside, and then we can pull it in. I don't want to pull them tight yet, I just want to get them all into position and then we can line up our wires and make them tight. For aesthetic purposes, trying to have all the heads go the same direction is for two reasons. One, it looks cool, but two, depending on how you're going to wire it up, meaning you may have multiple holes next to one another, the head doesn't cover the hole that you may be needing for the next run. On this one, obviously we won't need that because we're just running these two wires over and they're going to be sharing the same holes. Pull your wire to the appropriate stress-free length on both ends. Pinch it in place and pull the zip ties tight. Make sure that the wires don't cross each other. You want them to run flat on top of the board. Make sure when cutting off your heads you use a flush cutter and cut them as close to the head as possible. That way you won't create a razor blade to cut yourself with. This is what you end up with all the heads lined up and going the same direction. The same as on the top. Cutting the RCA heads off of this gives us the right amount of length. Tap into the factory amplifier. You dress up the wire with some exterior Tessa tape. At the very end here, I like to put a little piece of shrink wrap that will hold that tape in place. For the power and ground, we've wrapped those entirely in flex loom. Put ferrules on the end with with our five star shrink wrap. I like to add a zip tie to the end here to hold these wires into place so that they don't get stressed at the weak point here at the amplifier. Now they're attached to here and no matter what I do, it's not gonna hinder this connection at all. For our subwire, we ran a dual 12 gauge in that same braided loom. Finish the ends with ferrules. The same thing, add in a zip tie here at the base. I'm adding a few zip ties onto the other end of the amplifier to hold the speaker wire in place. And this is what I was talking about. I had to drill this other hole here, so there's gonna be two runs next to one another. The head is on the outside, which is exactly where I want it. I can thread my zip tie through the holes and the next hole in line isn't blocked by the head of the zip tie. So as I tighten it down into place, the two heads 
are in sync with one another. So this one was blocking this hole, this hole was free. Now that hole is clogged, this hole is open. So I can conceivably come down as many times as I want. But I don't need to because this amplifier is ready to get into the car. All our wiring is done. The amplifier is in place. All the power wire is gonna come up this side of the car. Here is the main power and the base knob wire in the center console. The ground and the sub wire come along this way. I've loosened this up so that I could pull the carpet back and that'll give me access to this point here, which is the factory ground. And then you can get in here, zip tie all your wires in place. This is the sub wire, which I'll run to the back here. And then the last step here at the amplifier is tapping into those wires. And that is what these guys are for. To connect in at our amplifier, we're gonna do the poke and twist method. That involves stripping back the wire. In this case, the remote turn on wire. Take a pick tool and separate them to make a hole just like a needle. This is more or less threading a needle. Strip back, I like to do about a half inch. Depends on how thick my wire is though. Thread it through the hole, pull it tight, and then wrap your wire around, smashing the hole closed. At this point, you could put some tape on it and consider it done. It's a half inch wrapped around. It's not gonna come loose. We could put a zip tie on there and hold that super tight. However, I like to add a little bit of solder to it just to glue it all together. Be careful if you decide to do this. You don't want the heat to transfer through the wire and do damage someplace else. So make sure your siren gun is nice and hot before you get the ball of solder on there. Make sure your solder ball sucks in nice and tight. Add in a piece of electrical tape. If you would like to add some Tessa tape afterwards to seal this back up, by all means do that. And we'll do the same thing for our speaker wires. Zip tie the wires all up into place, making a nice bundle. And that finishes us up here at the amplifier. We don't wanna put the cover back on it yet because we still need to get to these buttons so that we can set up the amplifier. Sometimes when you're working on a car and you forget, oh my gosh, I'm recording this. And in this case, I totally got caught up in running this subwire and I went ahead and got the subwoofer installed without showing it to you guys. It is a Rockford P3 shallow factory box with the grill. You do have to remove all of this to get to it so that you can get behind it, but it fits in here perfect. Seat goes back in and it puts out good base. Let's see where the grill is and the basket. The subwoofer box comes over to here and the same on the other side. If you have one of these cars and you manage to get that back seat out, the one thing you'll notice is there's this giant piece of rubber hanging over that. That does need to get cut. We just cut the area where the subwoofer box is, this right here. And then we can give this back to the customer so that if he pulls that subwoofer box out, a little bit of duct tape, we can put this all back in place and not worry about it for the next owner. If you're going to be doing a full box all the way across the back, then I do strongly recommend doing sound treatment back there because that mat does need to come off and it can add a little bit of noise to the car. Keep in mind, there's still six inches of foam from the seat, so it's not the worst thing. With the sub being in, we need a sub knob. Fernando came up with a great place to mount it here in the center console next to where the gear shifter is, which makes it really nice for us. We ran the control wire here next to it. To get it in there though, there is a little bit of trimming you have to do in this section to get that to sit flush in there, but there's no panel clips or anything like that that get removed. And let's see what it looks like in place. There it is. Some of you guys have asked in the past, what is the deal? This is a children's sock that we buy along with this, which is a steering wheel cover. And we use these on our installation. Underneath this is a piece of leather or some shiny plastic, possibly wood. And we don't want to scratch those. The easiest, simplest, affordable cover is two children's socks. There's one inside of the other. Slip them over this and that'll keep it from getting damaged. Fortunately for us, he already has these nice seat covers, so we don't have to worry about that. The last step of this installation, before we get to actually tuning it, is 
the fuse holder which Fernando is working on now. So let's join him and take a look. What Fernando has come up with for the fuse holder is our standard battery mount. We bend a piece of quarter inch ABS. We add our second bolt here. This bolt will come off, the whole panel will remove. The fuse holder disconnects from this mount, connects to the battery, very short run. We can turn it on and start the setup process for the amplifier. There are some test tracks you need to download from Kicker's website, so make sure you do that. I like to put them on my phone through Dropbox, but you can easily burn them to a thumb drive or whatever you'd like and put them in the USB. To tune this amplifier, there's two setups we have to do. First is the gain match track, and then the key a logarithm. With the tracks that you've downloaded, decide whether you wanna do negative five, negative 10. You're gonna push this button here for three seconds. Make sure your gain is turned all the way down. And you're gonna keep an eye on this light right here. It's a sweep track, so it'll go whoop, which you'll hear. And you wanna make sure the light is completely off through the whole track. All right, blinking, go. Press the button to exit out, and that is the first step. As you heard the sweep track go up and down, kept an eye on this light, made sure it was out through the whole setup process. Next step is the logarithm. For this, we wanna hold this button for more than five seconds. The LED will come on solid. Once it does that, play the corresponding track. So if you did 10 dB or 5 dB here, make sure you do 10 dB or 5 dB on this track as well. This is going to take a couple minutes to do. Just chill out, relax, and enjoy the view. This is, is ready. Mm -hmm. Go. Once the sound is over, it is not over. Be patient. It still takes the full minute and a half. After the light goes out, wait an additional couple seconds until this light flashes rapidly for a second or two. Once it has done that, you know you're safe and ready to go. I like to unplug the bass knob during this. Now I can plug it back in and we can get on to testing setting our crossovers, as well as our bass boost. Peak noise, we're gonna take a look at what it looks like before the key addressed it, and then after key done to it. It doesn't look that bad, it's actually pretty nice. But as you can see, there is a little bit of roll off here on this side. Turning the key on, it brings that all back. There's no bass boost applied to this. There's no loudness, there's no anything. This is just what the key is restoring from that signal. We can still go in and give it bass boost and all those other things. Obviously, we want to apply a crossover to it. It doesn't have one now. As you can see, having that key technology is pretty nice. Some of you might be thinking, well, it's only a 500 watt amp. Well, that's fine. You don't necessarily have to use this particular 500 watt amp to do it. The key lock, which is our high level to low level adapter, has the same functionality built into it and will do the same thing for your low pass. The trade off is it'll also do it for the high pass. So depending on what you're trying to do, there is a key for you. Go base. All right guys, there you go. That's putting a sub into a Toyota Tundra. Hope this video was helpful. Keep in mind guys, you can use this process for almost any installation you're doing. That's it, Fernando. On to the next one guys. You guys have a great night as always. We'll see you later next time. Bye. Bye.